Good morning. Good morning. And a happy Easter to you this morning. Thank you. I heard that. Thank you. That's awesome. If you have your order of service, we will begin with our welcome and greeting. And if you'll read with me responsibly uh, the bold print. Out of the darkness of grief and despair comes a message of hope. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. We run to the tomb to see for ourselves, and it is true. Christ is risen. We hear a voice call our name, and we know our risen Lord is with us now and always. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Thanks be to God. Let us pray. God of the resurrection, we gather today early this morning as the women did so long ago at your grave, yet we come as a community of faith with great joy to greet one another and to tell once again the amazing news they shared on that first Resurrection Sunday. Christ is risen. Love is victorious over death. You have given us new life in the name of your Son. May our singing, praying, listening, and proclaiming be a testimony to the power of your love to make us new creations in Christ our Savior. We pray in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Would you stand as we sing, if you're able? Christ, is, the Lord is risen today. The words are printed in your worship bulletin. Christ the Lord is risen today, alleluia. Earth and heaven in chorus say, alleluia. Praise your joys and triumphs high, alleluia. Sing Our gospel reading is from Luke chapter 24, verses 1 through 12. Hear these words of God. But very early on Sunday morning, the women went to the tomb taking the spices they had prepared. They found that the stone had been rolled away from the entrance. So they went in, but they didn't find the body of the Lord Jesus. As they stood there puzzled, two men suddenly appeared to them clothed in dazzling robes. The women were terrified and bowed their faces to the ground. Then the men asked, why are you looking among the dead for someone who is alive? He isn't here. He is risen from the dead. Remember what he told you back in Galilee, that the son of man must be betrayed into the hands of sinful men and be crucified 
and that he would rise again on the third day. Then they remembered that he had said this. So they rushed back from the tomb to tell his 11 disciples and everyone else what had happened. It was Mary Magdalene, Joanna, Mary the mother of James, and several other women who told the apostles what had happened. But the story sounded like nonsense to the men, so they didn't believe it. However, Peter jumped up and ran to the tomb to look. Stooping, he peered in and saw the empty linen wrappings. Then he went home again, wondering what had happened. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, good morning. Christ is risen. No, you didn't say that like you believed it. You said it like the first disciples did. Christ is risen. He is risen indeed. He is risen indeed. Let us pray together. God, it wasn't so long ago that it seems like we gathered together to celebrate the birth of Christ and reflect on the mysteriousness of the incarnation and the way that Jesus emptied himself of his divinity while at the same time perfectly reflecting your image. How he entered into the fullness of humanity with all of our, our joys, all of our pain, all of our grief and our sorrows. And through the muck and the mire, he proclaimed the good news of your love, even in the most hopeless of places. Lord, in this past week, we've witnessed as the worst of humanity rejected your gift of hope. They put Christ to death, attempting to deter the emergence of your, your kingdom breaking forth in this world. Lord, in those dark hours, we recognize the darkness that threatens our lives and the whole world, even today, the loneliness and grief so many experience, the humiliation and shame others endure, the illness and death that we all face at times, homelessness and hunger, division and war, hatred and oppression, the injustice and violence and abuse that we see in our world. Lord, within these realities and many more, we can see our own stories, the pain and suffering that's true in this world is not abstract to us because we experience it. It's common for all of us, and even you shared in it. But Lord, on this day, on this day, you've rolled away the stone, and your light has pierced our darkness. On this day, the hope that Jesus lives and died has emerged and given us stronger faith than before. Baptized into death with Christ, we're being reborn into new life. Indeed, the whole world is being born anew as your kingdom bursts forth. And we know that, that many of us are still experiencing darkness in our lives. Even today, we, we still struggle. They don't simply go away because of this day. Life doesn't become perfect because of this day. But we're given the strength to endure, that our faith is renewed and we're strengthened with hope. Even more, we've been reminded that the promise of Easter is not just an idea that we sing and pray and that we preach, but Christ is alive and among us today. So, Lord, we pray that you might reveal your presence, that Christ's resurrection might give us hope like nothing else does, that you might fill us with your Holy Spirit, and that the truth of your kingdom and the kingdom we long for, a kingdom which we now pray for, will burst into our world. For we pray the prayer that Jesus taught us to pray, saying, Our Lord, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And give us this day our daily bread. And forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Have another gospel lesson I want to read to you the rest of that day, continuing from what Beth read earlier in Luke chapter 24, picking up in verse 13. On that very same day, two of Jesus' followers were walking to the village of Emmaus, seven miles from Jerusalem. And as they walked along, they were talking about everything that had happened. And as they talked and discussed these things, Jesus himself suddenly came and began to walk with them. But God kept them from recognizing him. As he he asked them, what are you discussing so intensely as you walk along? And they stopped short, sadness written across their faces. Then one of them, Cleopas, replied, you must be the only person in Jerusalem who hasn't heard about all these things that have happened 
there the last few days. What things, Jesus asked. The things that happened to Jesus, the man from Nazareth, they said. He was a prophet who did powerful miracles. And he was a mighty teacher in the eyes of God and all the people. And our religious leaders and other religious leaders handed him over to be condemned to death. And they crucified him. We had hoped he was the Messiah who had come to rescue Israel. This all happened three days ago. And then some women from our group of, the, of followers were at his tomb early this morning. And they came back with an amazing report. They said his body was missing. And they had seen angels who told them Jesus is alive. And some of our men ran to see. And sure enough, his body was gone, just as the women had said. Then Jesus said to them, you foolish people. You find it so hard to believe all that the prophets wrote in the scriptures. Wasn't it clearly presented that the Messiah would have to suffer all these things before entering his glory? And then Jesus took them through the writings of Moses and all the prophets, explaining from all of the scriptures the things concerning himself. And by this time, they were nearing Emmaus and the end of their journey. And Jesus asked if, if he could. Jesus acted as if he was going on. But they begged him, stay with us this night. And since it was getting late, so he went home with them. And as they sat to eat, he took the bread and blessed it. Then he broke it and gave it to them. And suddenly their eyes were opened and they recognized him. And at that moment, he disappeared. They said to each other, didn't our hearts burn within us as he talked with us on the road and explained the scriptures to us? And within an hour, they were on their way back to Jerusalem, where they found the 11 disciples and others who were gathered with them, who said, the Lord really has risen. He has appeared to Peter. This is the word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. Well, today we're joining with Christians all over the world, and we're celebrating probably one of the greatest events in human history, the resurrection of Jesus Christ. The fact that Jesus rose from the grave is truly a, a miracle, but what's mind-blowing is how this event still affects us today. 2,000 years later, we're still celebrating this momentous event. The resurrection is one of probably the most significant events in human history. I mean, it changed all of human history. And that's according not only to religious scholars, but to secular scholars as well. The death and resurrection of Christ has had some of the most impact on human history more than almost any other event in all of human history. Without the resurrection, there would be no church. Without the resurrection, there would be no Judeo-Christian moral or ethics or the way that we treat one another or respect each other. See, the resurrection assures us that Jesus' death on the cross is not the end of the story. It's just the beginning. Three days later, Jesus rose from the grave, and the women who visited the tomb, they were, they were surprised. They were, they were shocked. The disciples were astonished. Thomas doubted, right? Nobody thought it was going to be true. Even though Jesus had predicted his resurrection, no one believed it would happen. The disciples, they thought the women were crazy. It says in the Scripture they thought they were speaking nonsense, that this couldn't happen. I mean, the resurrection completely surprised everyone. Yet it motivated disciples to become fearless witnesses of Jesus, didn't it? It changed their entire lives. These guys who huddled in a room filled with fear now spoke boldly and were willing to die for the faith they were proclaiming. Because the resurrection is the foundation of our Christian faith. It's, it's what we believe. We believe Jesus is alive. That his resurrection is a guarantee of our future resurrection. That the resurrection of Jesus Christ is unique among all religious thought in the history of humanity. Other religions have strong ethical systems, just like Christianity does. They have holy scriptures, just like Christianity does. But only Christianity has a God who became human and literally died for the people that he loved and was raised again in power and glory. See, it's the resurrection that lets us know God's kingdom has broken into this world and that humanity is no longer headed towards destruction but is headed towards redemption and salvation. It's the resurrection that we know that, that death has been defeated, that Christ has been raised and will be raised again one day. It's through the resurrection that gives authority to the church to, to speak to the culture and the world around us. It helps us find meaning in life. It gives us hope in the midst of despair and loss and discouragement that Christ is alive. He's not a legend. He's real, and he's still living today. It's the resurrection it's that power that brought Jesus back to life that gives us that power as well. That Christ's resurrection from the dead, it means that sin and evil and hatred and suffering and tragedy and death, they don't have the final word. All of these things have been defeated if it's true. 
if it's true. Now, I was raised in church, so I've heard this story for a long time. I've been preaching on Easter's now. This will be the 27th Easter that I've preached. I was telling some folks earlier I would love to go to, to Stone Mountain one day and be able to go to the Easter sunrise service, but I'm usually busy on Easter. But one day, maybe I'll be retired and I'll get to go, right? Yeah. So I've heard the stories. You know, I've heard the parables since I was little. I was taught the golden rule by the time I was eight years old, nine years old. I'd learned the golden rule. I'd learned the parables, the good Samaritan, prodigal son. I'd studied the, the, the miracles and the, how Jesus healed people. And while Jesus did many wonderful things, not everybody agreed with Jesus, did they? I mean, some people disagreed with his message. And it upset some. And they had him killed. And the Romans stripped him. And they, they beat him. And they put a crown of thorns on his head. And they nailed him to a cross. And even as a kid, I remember thinking, this is horrible. I mean, this can't be the end of the story, Right? We, we don't want this to be the end of the story. When we read the next chapter and we find out Jesus is alive. But I'll admit, it's hard to believe, isn't it? Even 2,000 years later, it's still hard for us to believe. I mean, people don't come back from the dead. When you're dead, you're dead, right? I don't know how many times I've done funerals and stood there thinking, you know, to myself. And you probably have too, and maybe it seems childish and simplistic, but you have the thought, get up, don't you? You want that person to come back. You don't want to lose that person. But as I've grown older and I've studied the Bible, even though it shocked disciples, what I've done, I choose to believe this story. I choose to base my life on it. I mean, the evidence is insurmountable when you actually dig into it and begin to study it. Even secular scholars point out how Jesus was a true historical figure and lived and did unexplainable things. And you may disagree on whether he was bodily resurrected or not, but you can't disagree that Jesus was a real person, yet some people still don't believe. And over the past few years, we've seen a steady decline in the Christian faith, especially here in America, here in the United States. We now live in a culture that rejects traditional morality, rejects traditional beliefs, openly attacks belief in God, condemns traditional Christians as being judgmental and bigoted and hate-filled. Christians are not the majority in America anymore. And barring a miracle, traditional Christian, Christianity will find itself more ridiculed, more discriminated against, and we may even possibly begin to face persecution. And we have seen this growing in, steadily in America. Over the past 20 years, the number of, of Americans who don't identify with religion has grown from 8% in the year 2000 to 21% in the year 2020. And it's steadily increasing. Today, we're going to be confirming, though, we're going to be confirming eight students and baptizing two more. They're going to openly profess their faith in front of our congregation. Two of them are going to be baptized, and they're going to take the vows to live their life for Jesus Christ. But over the last 50 years, church attendance and membership has been steadily declining. Now, granted, there has always been skeptics, but they've always been the minority, but that number is growing in our culture today. See, in the past, most people... Even non-Christians, they viewed the church as important, and they viewed religious teachings as important. That's been changing, and it's going to continue to change. According to George Gallup, in their research, church membership and attendance in the United States was 73% when they first started their surveys in 1937. And then over the next 60 years, it remained over 70%. Something unique has happened in the past five years. For the first time in the history of our country, it's dropped below 50%. 50%. The numbers steadily decline. And a survey conducted by Pew Research Center, when asked if uh, they believed in God, 80% of adults in the United States said yes, but only 46% of them believe in the God of the Bible. 33% believe in a higher power of some sort. So adults said 46% said they believed in the Bible. 33% said they believed in a higher power. 20% today say that they don't believe in God at all, and that's up from just 8% a few years ago. And so doubt, though, has always been part of Christianity. Even the stories we just read in Scripture, right? The disciples doubted. The women doubted. Everyone doubted. When Mary Magdalene went to the tomb that first Easter morning and found it empty, she ran back to tell the disciples, but they didn't, they didn't believe her. It was too hard to believe. Jesus' own disciples didn't believe he was raised. And then Jesus physically appeared to them. Thomas was missing, and so he didn't believe, right? Remember that story? 
He says, look, he did some amazing things. I mean, when he fed the 5,000, that was mind-blowing. When he walked on water, still hadn't gotten over it. But coming, up, coming back from the dead, I just don't buy it until I see him myself. And then he had a personal encounter with Jesus, and it changed everything. I mean, Jesus told them three different times that he was going to die and be resurrected. Just earlier that same week on Tuesday, he had told them the Messiah must be crucified. And then three days later, okay, must have flown over their heads, right? They must have taken this to be figuratively, not literally. It's so interesting to me that, that the religious leaders believed it more than the disciples because the religious leaders went to Pilate and they said, hey, he claimed that he was going to come back in three days. We got to make sure that doesn't happen. So can we put some guards at the tomb? You know what I mean? To make sure that they don't come and steal the body or he doesn't resurrect or he didn't come out of there. But the disciples, they don't believe. They're terrified. And they're wondering if they could be next. And these women, they show up and they say the tomb was empty. And they're thinking, what's going on? These women must be filled with nonsense, right? They, they don't understand what's happening here. So if you have doubts about the resurrection, listen, you're in good company. The disciples didn't believe at first. It's, it's hard to believe, but the disciples had their doubts wiped away when they had a personal encounter with Jesus Christ. And they became eyewitnesses. In fact, all the scripture is filled with eyewitnesses. All the stories that we read are from eyewitness testimonies of people that saw Jesus, Mary Magdalene, the other women, Peter, the two travelers on the road to Emmaus, uh, the, the disciples, Thomas, the seven disciples who were fishing, James, Jesus' brother, and ultimately even Paul had a personal encounter with Jesus. And Paul tells us this in 1 Corinthians 15. He says, I passed on to you what was most important and what had been passed on to me, that Christ died for our sins. Just as the scripture said, he was buried and he was raised from the dead and on the third day, just as the scripture said. He was seen by Peter and then by the twelve. And after that, he was seen by more than 500 of his followers at one time. Most of them are still alive, though some have died. And then he was seen by James and later by the, all the apostles. And last of all, as though I had been born at the wrong time, I also saw him. So the writers of the Bible are eyewitnesses of Jesus' resurrection. And we read their eyewitnesses account and we can choose to believe or not. But the truth is, down deep, we all want this story to be true, don't we? I mean, we want this story to be true. Who wants suffering to be the final word in life? Who wants tragedy to be the very final word in life? Who, who wants pain and evil and hatred and death to be the final word? We want hope and joy and victory to be the final word, don't we? I mean, that, that's, that's what we want this story to be. So if you're a doubter and you're thinking to yourself, you know, prove it to me. Well, you know, I really can't prove it. I, I can't prove it to you. All I can say is there's multiple eyewitnesses account in the Bible. They saw him. They touched him. They ate with him. So you have to choose. Either you believe it. Or you don't. Faith is your choice that you make. You choose to believe this amazing story. And you all know the power of an eyewitness, don't you? I had, a few years ago, a friend of mine witnessed a wreck. And after the wreck was, you know, for some reason she decided not to leave. She wanted to stay there. You know, when the police showed up, all of a sudden the guy who hit this other lady changed the story. And my friend was an eyewitness. And so the police believed the lady who had hit you know what I mean? That the guy had run the light. He was trying to say he didn't run the light, that she did. But she had eyewitnesses who were able to testify for her and say, no, 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 no. He was the one. We all know the power of an eyewitness, don't we? We've all experienced that in, in some way or another. And it's not just the eyewitnesses in the Bible. We have every Christian for the past 2,000 years, don't we? The early church fathers and even people in our own lives who have experienced Jesus Christ. Somebody you know is a witness. And they told you about their personal encounter with Jesus Christ. They, they shared the truth with you. So we have the original eyewitnesses and we have contemporary eyewitnesses that share this story. And we choose to believe in it. So let's look at one of these resurrection stories. The stories of these two followers that took place on the afternoon of that first Easter. They're, they weren't among the twelve. One of them name is Cleopas. The other's name is not given. These guys... They give up everything to follow Jesus. They leave their house, their homes, their families, their jobs to, to follow Jesus. They believe he's the Messiah. They've gone to Jerusalem hoping that Jesus is going to proclaim his kingdom there and be crowned the king. But instead, he's arrested, he's beaten, he's tortured, he's nailed to the cross. They watch him die in agony. They watch Joseph of Arimathea and Nicodemus take him down from the cross. And then they spent Friday and Saturday in total shock. They're trying to process what's happened. You've been in that situation, haven't you? 
I mean, we've all faced situations like that. When someone dies tragically or suddenly, we're always shocked. We sit around feeling like we're in a dream, don't we? This just can't be real. It can't be real. That's what happened that Saturday. By Sunday morning, though, reality sets in. And these two guys, they realize that there's nothing left for them in Jerusalem, so they decide they're going to head home. Let's go back to our normal life. But early Sunday morning, they're preparing to leave. A couple of women come running in, and they told them the tomb was empty. They thought somebody had taken Jesus' body. But when, when they left there, they were there, these two men, they, they, they said they were dressed in white, and they told them that Jesus was alive. But these disciples and these two guys, they don't believe that story. It's just too hard to believe. So later that day, they decide to make their way down to the town called Emmaus. It's about seven miles from Jerusalem, about a two-hour walk. They had time to think about their disappointment. They just can't believe it. See, doubt has always been part of the Christian faith. It always has. It's always been part of the story of Jesus' resurrection. I mean, even after they've heard this wonderful story of the women, right? They've heard this good news. They were still gloom and doubt. These two disciples, they heard the story, but they, they left the city. They left the other believers thinking that their hopes in Jesus have been dashed. And their reaction is evidence of how some folks doubt in spite of clear evidence. We still doubt. Maybe they're beginning to have doubts about God's love or God's reality, that he cares about him, that, that journey that they're on in life. And this journey is filled with disappointment and despair, sadness. William Barclay actually says in his commentary that their, their faces were twisted with grief. The passage we read said sadness was written across their, their faces. And every one of us, we're going to walk that path in life, aren't we? Or we feel like our faces are twisted with grief where sadness has walked across uh, written across our face. A journey where we feel like the world's falling apart all around us. We feel despair where we ask the same question. If, if there is a God, why is this happening? For some people I know, that walk is from the unemployment office. How can it be that I've lost my job? How can it be I'm unemployed? How did this happen? For some people, maybe it's a walk from a doctor's office. When you receive bad news, the test came back positive. For some, maybe it's leaving a courthouse with divorce papers. And what started off so wonderful has now come to an end. For some, it's maybe a teenager or a grandchild who's not walking the path you hoped they would walk. And you're asking, where did we go wrong? For some, you may be walking alone now because death has taken someone you love. All of us are going to walk this path of despair, aren't we? All of us are going to feel sad and, and grieved. Notice how Jesus comes into the disciples. It said, as they talk and discuss these things with each other, Jesus came and he walked along with them, but they were kept from recognizing him. Some people think, you know, God calls them to not be able to recognize Jesus. Like, you know, but I, I, nobody recognized Jesus because nobody's expecting him, right? Mary Magdalene thinks he's a gardener. Nobody thinks that, right? Even if he walks up to him and he's talking to him, they may think, you know, he looks a lot like Jesus, but he can't be Jesus because he's dead. That, that's kind of what they're thinking. They're walking along, and the stranger comes up, and he sees their grief, and he asks, why are you so sad? And they tell the stranger about what Jesus had done and how we had hoped him in. And the stranger begins to walk with him. He could have said, hey, look, it's me, it's me. But he doesn't do that, does he? He invests in them. He spends time with them. He walks along with them. He listens to them. And then he begins to explain the scripture, don't you know that the Messiah had to suffer and die? And he explains from the beginning in the Garden of Eden how God has been working in our lives. And he explains the law and the prophets and the Psalms and why the, why the Messiah had to die. In his book, Adam Hamilton wrote about the final words of Jesus that we've been reading through Lent. He points out how Jesus doesn't change what happened. As far as these two disciples are concerned, Jesus is still dead. But what Jesus does is he begins to change their perspective on the situation how they see the situation. He helps them to see God at work through this, that God is going to do something redemptive through this. Maybe it's not all lost. Maybe there is hope. Their perspective begins to change. You see, because Jesus is not, he's never been in the prevention business. He's always been in the redemption business. He brings good from the bad things in our lives if we walk with him. He gives us strength to endure that's what Jesus does in our lives. He doesn't always fix everything the way that we want him to. He doesn't always remove the cancer. He doesn't always heal your marriage. He doesn't always change your child. What he does is he changes our perspective on the situation, how we see it. And as a result, these disciples, 
they feel their hearts lifted from despair and hopelessness. And they begin to, to look for God's activity in the midst of their despair. That God brings hope to the hopeless, faith to the faithless. And he changes our perspective. This is the way that Jesus comes to us, isn't it? I mean, many times he comes along beside us, but we don't, we don't recognize him. We don't see him. Many of us have had these kind of experiences where someone came along and they said something to us and it changed our whole perspective. The way that we saw the situation that we were in and while we thought everything was lost, now our perspective begins to change and our hearts are filled with joy and with hope and they're lifted up. See, through the presence and, and words of someone else, we can experience the risen Christ. Jesus came to these, these disciples as a stranger and he listened to them. He heard their hurts. And often Jesus comes to us in the same way. And the situation may not change, but our perspective will change. And that makes all the difference in the world. I mean, have you ever had an experience that at the time it seemed like it made no sense? I mean, in fact, you kind of thought it was contrary to Christ's will in your life. That's exactly what happened to these men. They, they had hoped that Jesus was the promised Messiah, they, that he would save them. But he died a horrible death. And it ended their hopes and dreams. And so it seemed until Jesus came and they walked along with him. And he opened their minds and their hearts to the truth. So if you're going through a difficult time right now, maybe you're feeling some despair. Maybe you're feeling some hopelessness. Maybe you don't, Maybe life's not going the way you had thought it would go. Maybe there's sadness written across your face. Keep walking in faith because Christ is with you. And God is opening up your heart and your mind. He'll be there for you. It says as they, as they approached the village that they were going to, it seemed like Jesus was going to continue on his way, but they urged him, stay with us, for it's nearly evening. The day is almost over. So they, they went in, and he went in, and he stayed with them. Now here Jesus is. He's a hidden stranger who has talked with him now for two hours, and they've reached this destination, and he acts like he's going to continue going on and, and, and leave them. Hey, guys, I hope things turn around for you. Maybe you find some hope soon, right? No. I mean, do you really think Jesus is going to keep walking? What do you think Jesus is doing right here? I think he's testing them, don't you? He's testing them to see are they going to practice the things that he had taught them. What did he teach them? Love God with all your heart, your soul, your mind, your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself, right? Do you remember that one parable he taught in Matthew 25, the parable of the sheeps and the goats? When he told them, for I, I was hungry and you gave me food. I was thirsty, you gave me something to drink. I was a stranger and you welcomed me. I was naked and you clothed me. I was sick and you took me in. I was in prison and you visited me. And the righteous answered, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and give you food or thirsty and give you something to drink? And when did we see you as a stranger and welcome you? And when, when did we see you naked and give you clothes? And when was it that we saw you sick or in prison? And, and we visited you, and Jesus answered, Truly I tell you, just as you did it for one of the least of these, you did it for me. So he was a stranger. He had nothing to drink or eat, and he's walking with them. Would they welcome him or they let him go? Would they urge him to stay? So they passed the test, didn't they? They did what Jesus had taught them to do. I wonder what would have happened if they let him go. You ever thought about that? What would have happened? They would have not ever seen the risen Christ. See, the only way that they saw Jesus was after they welcomed him. When we welcome the stranger, when we do the things that Jesus has taught us to do and offer mercy and grace and forgiveness and acceptance, we see Christ's presence in our lives. When we do the things that he taught us to do, our eyes are open to his presence with us. See, they were blinded to his presence because they were focused on their own disappointment their own agenda, right? Their own dreams, their own desires, what they wanted. They were focused on themselves. And what Jesus calls us to do is focus on others. And when we do, we experience his presence. Amen? We see his presence. Only, only when they invited Jesus to join him, they see him. It says when he was at the table with them, he took bread and he gave thanks and he broke and he gave it to them. And then their eyes were open and they recognized him and he disappeared from their sight. You see, when they sat down, he, he didn't remove a disguise. It wasn't, it was when they saw him do something familiar that they recognized him. And what was left there? A plate and a cup, right? 
See, when Luke tells this story, it's about 40 years after this. And for 40 years, the disciples had been celebrating the Lord's Supper, this meal, remembering Jesus' presence. That they felt him, they saw him when they shared this meal, when they sang the songs. They felt him when they listened to his stories and they read scripture. See, in the midst of worship, that's when we experience Christ's presence. We still experience Jesus in worship, don't we? That's why we come together, because we feel his presence. See, if you want to know that Jesus lives, then come and worship. Come with an open heart and sing his praises and listen to the scripture and to the message. We experience Jesus in worship. Worship changes our perspective, the way that we see the world around us, the possibilities. It prepares us to see Jesus active in the world. Something happens when we worship together. Now, I know some people think, well, you know what? I don't need to come to church to worship, and that's true, but I've never seen people jump, break out in hymns on the golf course. It just doesn't happen. You mean, I've heard other four-letter words on the golf course, right? But I don't hear a lot of, hallelujah, praise the Lord. You know what I mean? I, I, don't, I don't see that. I mean, you don't have to come to church. and You can worship Jesus anywhere. But yet, when we come to church, it helps us to focus on Jesus. There, there's something that happens when we come together for worship and we share in conversation with Jesus. See, these two disciples, they nearly missed the greatest event in history because they were too focused on their disappointment. They didn't realize that Jesus was walking with them because they were focused on themselves. And get this, they're walking in the wrong direction, aren't they? They're walking away from all the other believers. They're isolating themselves. So often that's when we miss the presence of God is when we walk away from the church and the body of Christ. We miss his presence because we're focused on ourselves and our wants and our desires. We miss his presence. So I want to encourage you to make worship a priority. Now we're coming out of this pandemic. Make it a priority to be in church every Sunday that you can be because we experience God's presence when we come together. That's what the choice we make. That's how we experience it by supporting each other. Amen? And so this day, I pray that you'll know that Christ's presence is with you. No matter what you're going through, no matter what walk you're taking in life, that Jesus is right there with you. And if you'll take your, your focus off yourself for just a few seconds and you'll put it on the needs of others around you, you'll do the things he asks you to do, his presence will become clear. Amen? Let's pray together. I want to invite you to place your, your trust in Jesus today because trust is always a choice. When you're a little kid, you trusted your, your mom and dad and you jump into their, their arms trusting they'd catch you and they'd hold you. And I want to invite you to put that same trust in Jesus today. Just pray this simple prayer maybe in your heart. Jesus, I, I trust you in my life. I trust in your love. I trust that you walk with me even when I don't see you, that your presence is there. I trust that you forgive me, that you love me, and help me to follow you, to worship you, and live my life for you, to love the stranger and those in need, and to, to see you in my daily life. Father, I pray your blessings upon all of us gathered here today. Pour out your Holy Spirit upon us and help us to know you, to love you, to worship you, to walk with you through all the days of our life, to place our complete trust in you. For it's in your Son's name we pray. Amen. I want to invite you to join me in the communion liturgy that you'll find on page 10 there in your bulletin. And as you're turning, I want to share with you the invitation that's there. Jesus Christ, our risen Lord, invites to his table all who love him and earnestly repent of their sins and seek to live in union with him and peace with one another. So therefore, let us confess our sins before God and one another. Loving God, we confess that we do not share the joy of the resurrection, but get caught up in the worries of the world. We do not always live in the spirit of new life, but remain disconnected, grumbling, and anxious. <laughs> We're not living out the sharing the good news. Forgive us when we find it more comfortable to worry and complain than to faithfully follow Christ. Call us back to your ways, O oh God, to seek hope, forgiveness, peace, and mercy in the name of the risen Christ. Amen. Hear the good news. Christ is risen. The stone is rolled away. The tomb is empty. Mary called out, I've seen the Lord. We have seen Christ too. In every helping hand, 
in every heartfelt gift shared with those in need, in every choice to restore hope and share mercy with others in the world. We're called to this new life in Christ, a life of forgiveness and reconciliation. In the name of Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Glory to God. Amen. And if you'll join me there in the great Thanksgiving. The Lord be with you. Lift up your hearts. Let us give thanks to the Lord our God. It is right and a good and joyful thing always and everywhere to give thanks to you, Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. For you formed us in your image and you breathed into us the breath of life. And when we turned away and our love failed, your love remained steadfast. You delivered us from captivity to sin and death. And you made covenant to be our sovereign God and set before us the way of life that leads to everlasting life with you. And so with your people on earth and all the company of heaven, we praise your name and we join their unending hymn saying, Holy, holy, holy Lord, God of power and might, heaven and earth are full of your glory. Hosanna in the highest. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Hosanna in the highest. Holy are you and blessed is your son, Jesus Christ, who came to us in spite of our destructive ways. He healed the sick. He raised the dead, cast out demons. Jesus sided with the oppressed, offered mercy and compassion for those who suffered and gave dignity and forgiveness to outcasts. In spite of his glory-revealing presence among us, we turned him into a man of sorrows, acquainted with grief. Jesus was persecuted by religious leaders and betrayed by one of his own. He was lied about, tortured, and hung on a cross to die. When he was falsely accused and condemned to death, Jesus refused to do harm. While he hung on the cross, he prayed, Father, forgive them, for they know not what they do. By the baptism of suffering, death, and resurrection, you've given birth to your church. You've delivered us from slavery to sin and death, and you've made with us a new covenant by water and the Spirit. By your great mercy, we have been born anew to a living hope through his resurrection from the dead. On the night on which he gave himself up for us, he shared a meal with the disciples and he took bread from the table and he gave thanks to you and he gave it to his disciples saying, take, eat, this is my body which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And when the supper was over, he took the cup and he gave thanks to you and gave it to his disciples and said, drink from this, all of you, this is my blood of the new covenant which is poured out for you and for many for the forgiveness of sins. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. On the day you raised him from the dead, he was recognized by his disciples in the breaking of the bread and in the power of your Holy Spirit. Your church has continued in the breaking of the bread and the sharing of the cup. And so today, in remembrance of these your mighty acts in Jesus Christ, we offer ourselves in praise and thanksgiving as a holy and living sacrifice in union with Christ's offering for us as we remember his life and death, his resurrection, and the eternal life he offers to us as we proclaim the mystery of faith. Christ is dying. Christ is risen. Christ will come again. Pour out your Holy Spirit on us gathered here and on these gifts of bread and wine and make them be for us the body and blood of Christ that we may be for the world the body of Christ redeemed by his blood. Offering ourselves to be God's presence in the world until Christ comes in final victory and we feast at his heavenly banquet. Through your Son, Jesus Christ, with the Holy Spirit in your holy church, our honor and glory is yours, Almighty Father, now and forever. Amen. I'm going to invite Beth to come over and help me to serve. We'll be taking communion by intention, and we'll be inviting you to come up just as you feel led uh, to do so. And, and you'll receive a piece of bread, and you can dip it into the cup and then return to your seats.
you take a minute just to turn around and look and just see that beautiful sun that has risen while we were in service. It's just a beautiful picture, a beautiful sight this Easter morning. We invite you to stand as we sing, He Lives. remain standing and join me there in the dismissal and the blessing. Remember the good news that we have received and proclaimed this day. The good news in which we stand and through which we are being saved. We will remember and hold tightly to the truth we proclaim with joy. Christ died for our sins just as the scripture said that he would. But the story doesn't end in death. Christ was raised on the third day just as he promised. We are witnesses to this good news, and God commands that we do not keep this news to ourselves. We will testify to all that Christ is Lord. Christ is risen. Christ is risen indeed. Glory to the Father. Amen. Amen. Happy Easter. We hope you have a wonderful day. Thank y'all for joining us this morning, and we will see you later on. We still got some coffee and donuts, so if you want to hang around for a little while, you're still welcome to do that. We have our next service at 9 o'clock if you want to hang out and be part of that. We do have um, eight kids being uh, confirmed and two being baptized, so you may just want to stay for that part of the service, and you can slip out uh, to be able to celebrate with them, but we're glad you're here this morning. Have a wonderful day.